If you do all that investment in rice production, you do all that effort, and the farmers pick it up and produce rice. But at the end of the day, there is no protection for uh, the farmer or his produce from the wildlife, and the wildlife comes and eat everything that the farmer produces. It's like, what is the essence of uh, uh, the, the farmer's work? What is the essence of all the investment that we are doing into, into, into that? What is the essence of all the technology that we are producing? Honorable Speaker, um, we had this year Gambia Environment Action uh, Program that was uh, from 2009 to 2018. But it appears uh, there was no program that was going on because one of the recommendations, I'm just limiting myself to this wildlife issue, in that uh, document is for harmonization and coordination to be done between the communities uh, where there is wildlife and they are not in protected areas. And we know, for example, the hippo is in freshwater area. That is URR and CRR. And we are all dependent on URR and CRR for rice production. We feel that this is the area where Gambia can actually ma maximize the production of rice. But Honorable Speaker, everywhere, you know, uh, in the, uh, near the river, everywhere in URR where we are producing rice, the hippos are habit, uh, um, inhabiting uh, in the fresh water, that is the river. And therefore, they need food. So they come out of the river, get to the rice field while people are sleeping, away from their farms, and eat up everything that is produced. Honorable Speaker, this year, the people of Sutukoba produce very good rice and in abundance. But everything has, I can say, almost half of the produce have gone to naught because the hippos have moved from CRR <laughs> where, there, <laughs> where there is little, because the CRR got tired and did not produce uh, rice the way they used to do. So the hippos know that there is no food in CRR, so they start moving to search for food. And that's how they get their, themselves to, to URR. We have never experienced this in our area. I used to help my honorable friend to fight for this case. But then now I am affected. My area is terribly affected. These hippos have eaten up almost 50 plots of rice from Sutukoba rice field. And we already have a law which says they are endangered species and we should not kill them. So the farmers are now saying this National Assembly has given more importance to the hippo than to them and their, and their families. That's what they are telling us, that we are human beings and we are producing our, our crops and hippos are coming to eat everything up, but we are saying we should not kill the hippo. So this is the crisis between the hippo and the humans. And it is us who should resolve this crisis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And also thank you for expressing your sincere solidarity with the people of uh, URR and CRR. But we also seize this opportunity to um, sincerely express our solidarity with the victims who are affected by this stormy wing day for yesterday. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, to start my intervention, uh, as a member of Trade Committee, um, we went on tour and we discovered a lot and we also learned a lot. Uh, Madam Speaker, our ultimate objective is uh, Gambia to become self-sufficient in terms of food, to also be economic independent. But there are some simple techniques that we can implement 
and we'll be able to arrive at that. Um, if you look at the market, the competition is very high, but you hardly see factories in the Gambia who are able to compete in the sub-region, talk less of competing in the international market. It's simply because we are not able to standardize our products. One, two, the whole country, there is no standard accredited lab in the country. Apart from ICT, when we will be able to mobilize our domestic resources, that will earn us even to an, a, a, a stage where the executive will not bother themselves again to go and attend donor conference and what have you. Because domestic resources alone can develop this nation when we properly mobilize it. And this is one of the factors that is necessary for the executive to look into that, work with the Ministry of Trade to make sure that at least we have an accredited lab, both in our hospitals, in our factories. It's the example, we have a factory here, like Jaja Tomato Factory. He is doing very well, but he will not be able to compete in the sub-region simply because the product that he's producing is not standardized. And simply because if you want to test that product again, you must export it to a country, either Senegal or other sub country in the sub-region, to test for the product, whether it meets the standard or not. Then, from there, he'll be able to export. But if government has some of those uh, uh, institutions in the country, definitely it will help our trade sector. Um, Madam Speaker, also, we talk about energy. Um, energy, uh, I can say, is a need, not even a want. But I think our acts, we need to look into it thoroughly to make sure that what is in the act, if you go to URR, most of the fuller communities, you see one out of 10 who has maybe uh, 500 people living in the community. Then if you said, now if your population is not up to maybe 1,500 or 2,000 people, then you will not benefit from this, from the government, which means you are depriving those people. And the same thing happened also in our Water Resources Act. You go to URR, go to Sandu, there are armlets. They need clean water, but because of the, the size of the settlement, they are deprived. You said if your people don't, if the inhabitant in that community is not up to 1,500 people, then you will not get this. Simply because I went there, I asked them, they said, yes, this is true, because when the system has a problem, they will not have means to repair. I don't think that should be an excuse. They are paying their tax. If they don't have means to repair, then what about the local councils who are collecting tax from them? I think those people need not to be deprived. You, if that's the case, and that's remain in the act, honestly, if you go to URR, 85% of the communities will not drink clean water because of the size of their village. So I think the, if the executive are not looking into that direction, Madam Speaker, you will help us make sure that we have an institution in this assembly that will guide the National Assembly members to come with private member bill to amend some of those acts so that our people also get what they should get from the national cake. If not, then still now it will remain like this. They will not have means to drink uh, clean water. Uh, Madam Speaker, for still the electricity issues, like water, in Sandu we have only two villages, that is Diabu and Das Land. They have other big communities that definitely need, and they have the means to buy from Nawek, if Nawek is able to give them uh, the supply. So, uh, Madam Speaker, also, when we come to this area of steel business, uh, I think National Assembly, um, to establish an institution, they are established to serve for a purpose. But when we enact and establish an institution, that institution is not serving the purpose that it is meant for, there's no need for the National Assembly to enact a, a, a bill or a law to establish such institutions. Like if you go to the business sector, we have the Act of National Assembly, there's a provision that is to, how to give power to the ministry to establish a, 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 an institution called GPPA, an institution called GAIPA. If those people are bypassed in terms of business, Madam Speaker, there's no need for us to come here and argue again we have an institution that should oversight out of our government projects. The GAIPA example, the fact is in some countries, 
GAIPA should have a representative in the executive whenever they are meeting for business or whenever they are meeting over a, in, an investment issue. Because GAIPA is there to advise the executive what they're supposed to do. GAIPA is there to advise the president in terms of business or investment. But if they are bypassed and GBPA is bypassed, then we just hear that contract is awarded, contract is awarded. I don't think that will tell well. So when institutions are established by act of parliament, it becomes a law, it should be respected. If we do not respect them, there is nobody who will respect our institution. We must make sure that we give that due respect to the institutions. Whenever business comes and investment, they should be put in picture and they'll be able to advise uh, the executive, advise the president to avoid what has happened here. We all know something has happened in this assembly here. But we didn't notice it, and we passed that bill. Had it been we have a checklist and check all this, whether it has passed through some of these stages, then what we found ourselves will not be. So I think we all need to be very careful uh, in that area. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, um, the Honorable Minister for Works is here. Uh, last year, or year before last, um, we made a promise that we will go to Sunday. And yet still, the same thing that he knew, I knew, uh, there are federals in Sandu, they have never been assessed. So we are appealing to the minister, coming his uh, next door, please reach Sandu and see these federals yourself so that you can send your team there to assess them and also include them in your next list that, uh, how to call you, will be providing or constructing federals in the, in the, in the regions. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member for Upper Fullard West. Okay, Kantora. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. First of all, I want to uh, recognize the presence of the cabinet ministers here in presence. I also equally thank your office, through the office of the clerk, and the entire staff of the National Assembly for making this second ordinary session a fruitful one. Um, equally, I want to also extend my sincere thanks and appreciation through um, to the government of the Gambia, through the Minister of Lands and Regional Governments, for the recent land allocation to MPs uh, in this parliament. It's well appreciated and it's also is uh, really welcome. Thank you so much, um, Honorable Minister of Lands and Regional Government, for that uh, statementship. I equally want to register my dissatisfaction and uh, disappointment through the Office of the Clerk for not adhering <coughs> to clause 87 of the standing orders that is there is a majority and a minority leader. We've seen members call themselves deputy majority leader which has no legal base or which has no reference to the standing order. I don't know where they derive their powers from. And as far as I'm concerned, it's very legal for you to recognize yourself and call yourself as deputy majority leader and a deputy minority leader. And uh, I think it is being captured in the revised standing orders. As of, as, of, as, of, as, of, as of now, it's very illegal to recognize such, and it's very legal for someone to call himself that uh, position. I have I've seen it has been recognized uh, by the office. And equally, as a concerned citizen of URR, I'm also calling on the NDMA not to only sit at the comfort zone of their offices, uh, thinking or relying on MPs report, relying on the assessment done by the fire service and police report. They should be on the ground to ass assess and ascertain the level of uh, destruction so that it can really inform them, because I believe that Without an adequate information, uh, you may not be able to make an informed decision. So for them to make an informed decision, 
they should also be opportune to go down there to assess the scenario so that it can also give a sense of direction for them to take a decision that will actually come straight to the damage caused. Um, we have discussed, I and the member of Woolly West, that from here we will really engage them and pass by the office to take a proactive um, step in addressing the system. Equally, I know efforts have been done in terms of the caste system in URR. It's really a concern, particularly in my constituency, Kantora. It, it uh, existed in two villages, that is Garawal and Koina. It's rather unfortunate. Um, these are, you know, the same tribe, the same people living together in peace and harmony for decades or centuries. I want the government to really fast track or take a, a robust move to make sure that they give a lasting solution to the problem in URR. I would, have, I, I would really appreciate if there can be, um, um, how do I call it, an um, ad hoc committee constituted by a government where you have relevant stakeholders, ministries, and then uh, MPs of the region to engage the community you know, in a dialogue to see uh, the way forward, how to address uh, this particular issue in URR. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I also I keep echoing this uh, particular issue uh, here. That is, I'm also a very good fan of the of um, e-government. That is, the to government to really embrace the ICT. I believe um, it will really, really uh, even help government in terms of tapping all the um, revenues that they need to um, uh, tap in the country. Um, E-government would even really help government in terms of increasing the level of transparency and also effective, eff effectiveness and efficiency in government operations and also eradicate issue of excess bureaucracy in the system. So therefore, I call on the Minister of um, Information, Communication, Technology to actually um, really work hand in glove to make sure that um, even our local council, the Minister of Lands and Regional Government, that even our local council should actually embrace e-government, mm -hmm. whereby these revenue collections are actually based through electronic. You can be in, uh, in your comfort zone or houses and you pay your bills. So this will really um, eradicate some kind of uh, unscrupulous acts or even corrupt practices within the system. It's really, it will sanitize um, the entire system, which will actually even make more saving for government. Because I did reiterate uh, when the Honorable Minister of Information, Communication Technology, that do you know that um, so many banks are operating in this country, their servers are hosted outside. So it serves as a loss of revenue for this government. And if TAP, if we can have a database center here, many of them will, will be actually asked to host their centers here, which even serve as a revenue um, generation. Likewise, the, the, uh, he also mentioned about the calls and the, the voice calls and the, the, the megabytes. Um, government has no device, tracking device, to ascertain the number of um, monies to be paid to government. So these are more revenue leakages. So I call upon the minister to actually really fast track the uh, migration um, for government to migrate to, to digital in terms of uh, the, the normal manual process. Thank you. May I at this point please um, recognize the presence of the of High Excellency, the Vice President. Your Excellency, you're welcome. And then I'll call on an honorable member to move a motion that we sit beyond one o'clock. Oh, well, I, you see, we are still learning. We thought that it's still the usual procedure, adjournment debate notwithstanding. But I'm just being informed by the technocrats that for adjournment debates, you don't need to move a motion to extend the sitting beyond one o'clock. So under the circumstances, we can proceed. Eh? And then I'll call on the Honorable Member for Basse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. Madam Speaker, I want to join my colleagues of Upper River Region to really thank you and thank all our colleagues who has expressed solidarity. And we do extend our sympathy to all those who have been affected. Honorable Speaker, 
I want to begin with uh, our engagement with uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs. Honorable Speaker, as National Assembly members, the tool that you use to work deep is the Constitution. And the second tool is the standing orders. And whatever we are doing here, it is in line with the Constitution. Whatever you want to defend, it is in line with the Constitution. The Constitution of the Gambia, 1997 Constitution, Section 152, with your permission, Honorable Speaker, reads that uh, annual estimates and uh, appropriation bill. Close one. The President shall cause the Minister responsible for finance to prepare and lay before the National Assembly at least 90 days before the end of the financial year estimates of revenue, estimate of the revenue and the expenditure of the Gambia for the following financial year. The estimates shall include any estimate which under the Constitution are to be submitted directly to the President by the Chief Justice or any other authority for presentation by the President to the National Assembly. And the clause three says, when estimate of expenditure have been approved by the National Assembly, an appropriation bill shall be introduced in the National Assembly for the issue from the consolidated fund or of the sum necessary to meet that expenditure, or rather an expenditure charge on the consolidated fund on the separate boards for the several services are required and for the purposes specified they are in. Honorable right, Speaker, when the government, the executive, want to present before this parliament the estimate of revenue and expenditure of this country for the financial year 1st January to 31st December 2019, it's been presented here by the Honorable Minister of Finance. So if we approve it through him, and him who has defended all the ministries and all the agencies here in this parliament, I think what the parliament has approved has become a law and is an act of parliament. And an act of parliament is to be executed as approved. So therefore, it will be very difficult for me to believe on the Honorable Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs that he is not directly responsible for the non-payments of salaries and allowances, which he is aware of. But referring us to PMO, Public Management Office, who is under the directive of the executive. If that is the case now, the executive is here before us. And according to our standing order, if we don't deal with the minister, we will deal with the vice president. And thank God the vice president is before us. So therefore, we want to have a clarity from the executive who is responsible for the non-payment of these uh, um, pending, pending salaries and allowances, especially the 100% allowances of our staff of the National Assembly. We want to have that clarity from the executive. Honorable Speaker, to continue, I want to join my colleague from Wooly West on the situation of our languages. You see, Honorable Speaker, 
I send a question to the Honorable Minister for Education. But thank God yesterday she was not here. Because the way she replied me, I am not expecting that reply from her. If you're talking about linguistic policy, linguistic policy is the decision of the government. And in her response, she is talking to me about educational linguistic policy. There's a difference between education pol a lang a linguistic policy and educational linguistic policy. I refer you to the Constitution of Senegal. Article 1 is clearly stated in the Article 1 that the official language of Senegal is French, and the national languages of Senegal are Jola, Mandinka, Wolof, Pular, Serer, and any other language that is codified in Senegal. Do we have national languages by constitution? We don't have. Do we have official language in this country? We don't have. Because the constitution is not there. So the, the decision of the government is not cleared about linguistic policy in this country. That's what you call linguistic policy. And from linguistic policy now, the languages that are captured in the constitution will help now the ministry responsible for education to come up with education linguistic policy. What are the languages that you're going to use as medium of instructions in your education system? This is the difference. And the minister knows very well this is the difference. But unfortunately, I don't know whether the way we appear on this language issue is not appreciated by the ministry, but the way they answer to us is, is not our expectation. Let me tell you, he is talking about to liberate our mind. You cannot liberate your mind with somebody's tool. If you want to liberate your mind, use your own tool. The language policy. If I stand here, I want to speak Mandinka. Nobody dare to stop me and tell me don't speak Mandinka. <laughs> because it's my constitutional right. But if I start speaking Mandinka now here, I can be stopped. It is not in the constitution. Where, what will be my base? And unfortunately, in the constitution provision 105, is telling the business of this parliament should be in the English language, a national assembly, which is a shame to us. How can you liberate our minds if you are not prepared for it? Without a language policy and without a proper educational language policy in this country, our liberal will never be liberated. When I went to Kenya, I met an MP from Rwanda. I asked her, what is your secret in Rwanda? For this fast development, she told me in one sentence, our secret is all of us speak one language, the same language in Rwanda. The president doesn't need an interpreter. The minister doesn't need an interpreter. Everybody speaks the same language. Everybody understands each other at the same time. This is the secret of development. But here, if you go to the upper river region, what the minister is saying and what the translator is translating to the target group is quite different. At the end of the day, what will happen? Miscommunication. That's why we are facing so many problems in this country. Because we are no custodian of our, our own destiny. Our language, we cannot speak it. We cannot develop it. And he said, how many people can write your own language here? <laughs> Without language policy. Without educational language policy. You cannot do it. So therefore, let us be very serious about this language policy issue. How many literacy centers have been started and they are now closed down? Do you know why? Because there's no language policy. 
and the education today cannot be fulfilled at the absence of adult literacy. And adult literacy cannot be exercised in this country if our national languages are not used as tools of communication and instructions. But how can we do that? People of like us who are day and night singing the promotion of national languages, what encouragement are we having? We are not having the begging of the uh, executive, neither the Minister of Education. How can you move this country? How can you develop this country? Last time I was discussing with my colleague, Honorable Jata, the member for Wulivers, that the problem of agriculture can be solved. And we can say agri-literacy. Agri the farmers just take 10 people from each community, come and train them in 10 days in their national language. They will be the experts for the, for, 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 for the others in, the, in their villages. We don't need extensions. That's what Senegal did. That's why farmers today are in charge of their own farming problems. We need to be very careful if you come to language. It's one of the most important resources, one of the most important tools if we are serious with the development of our country. Honest speaker, if time permits, my engagement with uh, GAIPA concluded that if you want to be serious about the development of Basi, we just need two things, industrial zone and dry port zone. So I want to engage the Honorable Minister for Lands and Local Government. What is your take in that? Honorable Speaker, in the sub-region, there are two cultural events that are material as far as sub-regional integration is concerned. That's uh, Safra and uh, FISO. And uh, Safra is a French acronym, in semaine d'amitié et de fraternité, which is happening between six countries within the sub-region, Mauritania, <coughs> Mali, Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau and Guinea-Conakry, represented by their borderly regions. And they meet to discuss issues for re uh, uh, integration. Well, you have about three minutes more. Thank you. This, if these uh, projects are not even recognized in our country. And this time, when I was at Abuja, when I met the commissioner, on free movement, trade custom, when I explained this project to him, he told me, did your national assembly know about this? I told them no, because I never explained to them. And this is one of the tools that the entire sub-region can use in order to foster sub-regional integration. So therefore, I'm bringing that to your attention. If you need more lecture on it, next time I could be prepared for that, and I'll give you the lecture for you to understand what is Safara and what is FISO. FISO is a festival international Soninke. It is also taking regional character. Honorable Speaker, finally, peace and stability. We need peace and stability to develop our country. And if you want to preserve peace and stability in this country, we just need tolerance and dialogue. Any activity that we have to do in this country, let us make sure so we do it within tolerance and we do it through dialogue. So, honest speaker, with this few remark, I want to thank you sincerely for giving me that opportunity. I thank you and beg to resume my seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Member for Upper Fuladu West. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you know, the honorable members you know, who have, in their interventions, expressed their solidarity with the people of uh, CRR and URR who are affected by these devastating storms in the past few days. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would first of all would like to uh, start my intervention with the issue of uh, Banjul Breweries Limited. Uh, as rightly said here uh, by the uh, Honorable Member for Banjul Note, the issue is becoming to a point where the intervention of this National Assembly is very much needed to reverse the situations. If at all we want to quickly and swiftly come to an amicable solution. Uh, today, as she mentioned, there is a protest going on at, around the Westfield area by the staff of this company uh, showcasing their frustration and uh, plight in what is going on with their, with, their, with, their, with their company. Yes, rightly so. We ratified a bill during the last uh, budget speech where proposals were uh, forwarded by the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs for tax increments. Uh, one of these taxes you now was the excise duty tax on locally brewed al alcohol beverages. But since then, what has come to light now is the adverse effects of this law or, or, or policy, which uh, unfortunately is a border national shame, but also uh, uh, a shortcoming from our side for not doing justice by scrutinizing those proposals no further. Uh, but it's never too late. Our economy right now is hampered by this decision because the objective of this no, tax increments no, was to raise more tax. Banjul Brewers is contributing about $135 million a year to the, uh, local, uh, economy, uh, to the uh, uh, local tax, which is more or less like no, our budget allocation as a National Assembly. And uh, I understand the minister has a job to do to raise more taxes to meet the demands of our development uh, agenda, but it should not kill other companies or institutions now within the country who are already here, and in Banjul Bruce's case, over 42 years. Uh, our efforts to make the Gambia, an, uh, sorry, um, we want to make the private sector as a country the engine of you know, economic growth and job, 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 job creation, and also, more importantly, you know, to make Gambia an attractive destination for foreign, develop, uh, foreign uh, domestic investments. But unfortunately, I think you know, we are, this objective is defeated because Banjo Brewery has you know, been a flagship of a French company, is uh, threatened to close, and uh, as we will all accept, the French are very generous to our national development plan. So this is an issue, I think, you know, which is bringing more problems than solutions. So today, not only jobs are threatened, but also there is a low income collection, uh, tax collection, you know, due to the low productivity of the company, because their sales have dropped by uh, an average of 35% month in, month in, month out since January this year. And uh, just last month, when, uh, during my research, last month, the GRA was expecting about $16.6 million from, uh, from Banjo Brewers, but uh, they only managed to collect $7.1 million. So you will see that the objective you know, of raising taxes is hugely defeated. So I think, you know, just like what the Honorable Minister did with the cement issue and with the new vehicle policy, which we all ratified here, should use his prerogative to, or, 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 or uh, a discretion to equally reverse this decision. If not, I think he should engage in National Assembly you now forthwith to be able to address this issue without further delay. Honorable Member for Tumana. Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Uh, I will equally join my colleagues uh, to thank your honorable office 
and the rest of the parliamentarians who are in solidarity with the people of Upper River region and that of the people of the Sierra region. Um, Honorable Speaker, I will also use or seize this opportunity to thank the Honorable Minister for Water Resources. Um, I engage him on the windstorm that hit across the length and breadth of Upper River region, which my constituency is not uh, exceptional. Uh, there is a particular community in my constituency called Kulari Dembanyuma with a population of six to 7,000 people or inhabitants. Um, they were using um, five tanks to supply um, at least a potable drinking water in the community. But as I am speaking to you, five of those tanks were heated by the storm and as I am speaking to you, there is um, inadequate water in that community, and his office is aware, and uh, he already sent a team to do an assessment, and I believe uh, they are going to at least help the people of Kulari Dambanyumat. So thank you for that, Honorable Minister. Honorable Speaker, I have a series of issues on my list here but I will just prioritize. Uh, the first issue is the poor road network in my constituency. Uh, I have been saying this here, that my people have a lot of difficulties in terms of accessing uh, markets, in terms of accessing schools, in terms of accessing um, 